This is the 11th in a series of lectures on exterior differential systems. In this lecture we want to start from fresh and work only on the theory of partial differential equations. So we won't assume any of the material we've covered so far. Our concern here is that we've, we've been trying to understand how to prove the cartan kahler theorem and we've made use of the cauchy kovalevsky theorem in doing so. We haven't really explained what that theorem is and we want to not only know what, what the theorem says, the cauchy kovalevsky theorem, but also we want to try to think about how we can uh, work with that theorem in a, in, a, in a more effective manner so that we can um, get away from, uh, gradually at least, from coordinates. So here's the theorem. The cauchy kovalevsky theorem, or sometimes called the cauchy kovalevsky theorem, says that an analytic PDE system so u sub t, u derivative of u with respect to t, is some function of tx, u, and ux, defined in an open set of these variables. So t is a real number here, a real variable. x and u are vector variables in different, possibly different vector spaces. And um, we'll assume that, 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 that this, this PDE then is expressed as uh, giving the derivatives of all the u variables with regard to the t variable in terms of these other quantities. And if we are given an analytic initial data, u is u of x, of course everything's analytic, here's an analytic PD system. The function f is defined in some open set of its of the values of the variables t, x, u, and ux. If we're given analytic initial data, u is u of x at time t equals t naught, then there is a solution, an analytic solution defined nearby. Any two solutions uh, with that initial data will agree near that time. So uh, now it's not too surprising this should be true. Um, if you try and figure out why it would be true, you can see that we've given u um, as a function of x at a constant value of t, and then we've explained how u uh, varies as a function of t because we've given it the rate of change of u with regard to t. So it's not at all surprising that we can therefore figure out how to move in the t direction. Um, the proof, I won't give in any detail, give a rough idea of the proof. The proof starts out by expanding in Taylor series, both the, the function u expanded in a formal Taylor series um, with some abstract variables as coefficients, and the function little f expanded out in a Taylor series. Um, so we expand though, imagine expanding those out in a Taylor series. We're given u when t is constant, so let's say at t equals zero, we're given the value of u as a function of x, and so we can expand out its Taylor series in the x variables alone. Um, but then we can plug into the differential equation to figure out how the how the Taylor series that involve one power of u are one power of t are calculated in terms of those with no power of t, and so on and so forth. So in this way, we compute out a formal series solution. We compute out a formal Taylor series for u in terms of x's and t's. All the way out. Um, so step by step, we've constructed a formal solution, formal Taylor series solution. And the question is why that actually corresponds to an analytic function. So in other words, why does that formal series actually converge to an analytic function? The proof of convergence is, is, is the hard part then. It's done by comparing this PDE to a different PDE, which is explicitly integrable. We imagine that we have the given PDE ut equals at little f, and we compare it to a different PDE ut equals some g or something like this, some other function. And we make sure that f is smaller than g and that all of its Taylor coefficients are smaller so that uh, g will dominate, and so the solution of ut equals g will have all of its Taylor coefficients larger than the Taylor coefficients of ut equals f. But they'll have the same initial data, and so um, all we need then to do is to make sure that ut equals g, this other differential equation, has uh, some local solution. And we do that by, by picking it explicitly to be a known integrable PDE system. So that's how we can ensure that a PDE that we don't know much about has has a solution by comparing it with one that we do know a lot about. The real question we want to think about in this particular lecture is a change of variables. How can we change variables to get to Cauchy form? So that Cauchy form means the form 
that you know, that we had for our differential equation u t is f of t x u and u x. And again, u is a vector, x is a vector, but uh, t is just a single real number. To get to that form, if we had a general nonlinear PDE system, we'd have to find a clever change of variables that would decide which variable is going to play the role of t, because t plays a special role here. We've solved for all of the u functions, derivatives in t, in terms of the other quantities, in terms of little f of these other quantities. So that's what we have to be able to do to solve for all the derivatives in t. So we need to make sure that everybody's differentiated in t. If all of the various u variables, uh, all of the uh, dependent variables are differentiated with regard to a particular variable in our PDE, then, then it should be possible to solve for, for put it using that variable for our Cauchy form. So we've solved for one derivative, uh, ut, of, uh, with all, all, for all of the dependent variables views in terms of that one single t. So what we want to do then is to take a nonlinear PD and count derivatives and see what are the directions in which a derivative is taken, or several derivatives if we're looking at higher order PDE problems. So we need to count derivatives. How do we figure out how many derivatives a differential operator takes in a given direction? Um, and we want to do this in a way that's, that, that stays a, a, as, as much away from coordinates as possible. We want to think in terms of an almost coordinate-free approach. So let's suppose we take a linear equation for simplicity. We'll do the nonlinear case later. But for now, imagine we have a linear differential operator. How do we, without using coordinates, measure in some sense how many derivatives it takes in the different directions? So the idea is to hit it with a high-frequency wave. Imagine a linear differential operator hitting a high-frequency wave. Your favorite differential operator is probably the first derivative in a, in a single variable x in single variable calculus. Your favorite high-frequency wave is probably something like the sine of a constant multiple of x. And if you think about what happens, if you have a high frequency, so a high constant uh, from that constant multiple, then when you differentiate sine, you get cosine, but you differentiate inside the sine function, you pull out a copy of the frequency. So you can see that when you differentiate a high-frequency wave, you get a bigger wave. When you differentiate the directions in which the wave is oscillating, you, you re the result is a bigger wave. So every time we differentiate in a particular direction in which a wave is, is, is non-trivial, uh, in which a wave is oscillating, we get a bigger wave. But if we differentiate, we take a derivative in the direction in which a function is constant, we get zero. So the directions perpendicular to the to the oscillations will uh, will give us uh, some something being killed. So we get a, a, a sense that if you get to pick your wave, you get to construct your favorite wave in, in whatever oscillating in whatever direction you like, then you can test given an abstract differential operator, you can test which directions it differentiates in. Let's do this with a few with a few symbols. We'll imagine we have a, a, a number lambda, which we'll imagine gets to be large. And we look at a wave. What is a wave? In this case, we'll just write a wave simply as e to the i lambda f. We could, we could use sines and cosines if we like, but it would be easier to use complex uh, expressions, complex waves. We take a linear PDE, and uh, so a linear, linear differential operator p. And uh, we're going to try and hit it on, against that wave and see how it differentiates. It's convenient in this setup to take a solution of p, in other words, a function u non-zero, so that p of u is zero. So we'll take a non-trivial solution, not, not the zero solution, and we'll see what happens if we try to uh, use it to make a wave. We try and take that solution and then introduce a kind of wave di distortion of it. So that's how, we, that's how we'll do it. We'll expand out this guy, p, applied to the wave multiplied by the solution. So u is a solution, so p of u is zero, but p of wave times u will in general not be zero because p will start hitting the wave with its various derivatives. Imagine that p was just a single derivative, just derivative in some variable x, and you hit that expression. Then by the product rule, you'd either hit the exponential or you'd hit u. And similarly, if we have a differential operator of any order, we'll apply the product rule over and over again to that pr expression, product of wave times solution. 
when the derivatives hit that exponential, that wave, they pull down a lambda factor. Actually, they pull down an i lambda factor because it's i times lambda. Every time a derivative hits um, the exponential, we pull down a factor of i times lambda and we differentiate f. We do it over and over again. We always have another exponential factor showing up every time we do it. Let's do this in a, 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 in a, a, a convenient expression, organize it like this. So we've got our, our function um, u, which is a solution. We've multiplied it by a wave e to the i lambda f. We've then applied p to it, just as we did in the last slide. Now, that's going to always have an exponential factor, that e to the i lambda f, that wave, is always going to repeat itself. Every time you differentiate it, it keeps reappearing. So we'll multiply by e to the minus i lambda f to undo it, to get rid of the wave. So we've got our e to the i lambda f inside and e to the minus i lambda f outside, and they'll knock each other out so that what will be left over will be p's derivatives hitting over and over again, either hitting the, uh, by the product rule, either hitting the wave factor or hitting the solution factor. We divide it here by i to the m lambda to the m, and m is supposed to be the, the degree of the differential operator p, the number of derivatives it takes. Now, of course, we're not supposed to necessarily know what that is, but let's suppose we know the maximum number of derivatives appearing in any of the parts of p. For most of our applications, we're only going to really think about first order operators p anyway, so that'll just be m equals 1. So we've uh, we've got p applying to our wave, and then once we've got this factor in, we'll un sort of undo that wave, and then we'll divide off so that we get only the leading order terms. When we take lambda to infinity, we divide it off by this lambda to the degree m of the operator p, and so we'll expect that only the highest order terms that show up will actually survive taking the limit. This expression is called the symbol, the symbol of the differential operator p. And of course it depends on u and on f. But um, what's important, one thing that's important to, to recognize is it actually only depends on df. It doesn't depend on f directly. It actually only depends on its differential df or its gradient, if you like. You can see that that's intuitively believable because f appears here and then also here. And if you added a constant to f, you could see it would knock itself out. The constant would disappear. So, uh, so if you change f by a constant, you don't get anything happening. Uh, this this all works out to, to, to be the same. And so it's not surprising and, and not difficult to prove that it really only depends on the differential of f. So if we think of it this way, it's an operation that linearly transforms u by multiplying by something here, which involves df. Okay, m again is the order of p as a differential operator. So it's an operator of order, of order m here. That's the m. And again, for our applications, mostly m will be 1. This expression, sigma, is called the symbol. And it's a function on the cotangent bundle. What does that mean? Why is it a function on the cotangent bundle? It's a function on the cotangent bundle because um, we multiply by the value of u at a point. But other than that, ignoring the u there, it depends on this df. And df is a covector, or one form. So it's a section of the cotangent bundle. On the other hand, if you picked any cotangent vector, let's say xi, some cotangent vector, you could write it at least locally as, as xi being equal to df for some function f. If you pick, a, in other words, a covector at a single point, xi, a single point of your manifold, of your, well, space of, of x and uh, variables uh, on which the function u depends, you pick a, a, a single um, cotangent vector, you can always write that cotangent vector as being given by the differential of some function at that point. So uh, so that should be thought of really not as a df, not, not as being the differential of the, of the, of the uh, function giving the wave, f, but rather as, a, as the wave momentum. That's a wave momentum variable there. And uh, this sigma depends on that as a function on the cotangent bundle. Okay, cotangent bundle of what? Well, u is a function of some variables, and whatever space those variables parameterize, that's where it's a that's where this cotangent bundle shows up. Let's do an example. Um, we'll look at the heat operator. So p is derivative in t minus two derivatives in x minus two derivatives in y. So that's a scalar differential operator, 
and we can calculate out its symbol. I won't do the calculation. It's given in the in the lecture notes, and uh, you should give it a, a try as, as a simple exercise to expand out that limit and see what you get. What you find is that the symbol um, is going to eat uh, the differential df of some function and give us this quadratic expression. It gives us that expression in the first derivatives only, f. So the first surprise is that even though the differential operator involves second derivatives, its symbol applied to this function f only involves first order derivatives. And that's true for any order of p. The symbol only depends on df, that is to say, only depends on the first derivatives of f. So that's the first thing that's surprising. The second thing that's surprising is that it's nonlinear. It's a nonlinear function of the, of the derivatives of f, uh, even though it arises from a linear PDE. And that's because every time we differentiated, where p got p to differentiate our wave, it hit another copy, a different copy of the exponential uh, that, that gives the wave. And so every single time it was differentiating f only once and multiplying by the previous expressions it had from previous derivatives. So that's what we see. We see that it's a homogeneous function of second order in this case because p is a second order operator. In general, a homogeneous function of, e of order equal to the order of the differential operator and a function on the cotangent bundle. So homogeneous in each fiber of the cotangent bundle. Um, we also see that there's no dependence on t. You might think that you'd have an ft in there, but you don't because it don't only notices highest order derivatives. It really doesn't notice those lower order terms. So the symbol is not a very, um, a very uh, sensitive invariant. It's deliberately designed to be fairly rough in its, in its, uh, in its treatment of the, of, the, of the differential operator. It doesn't notice fine details like that, that derivative in t. If I drop derivative in t out of the expression of p, I would have got the same symbol. But we can see then that this, the symbol, if you plug in f equals t, so you get symbol applied to dt, would actually be zero. That means that t is a characteristic uh, variable, or that dt is a characteristic uh, covector, a characteristic one form. So we found that, in effect, this, there, there is some kind of uh, way that this symbol notices that there are certain directions where we're not taking derivatives. It notices them by vanishing in those directions, by vanishing in the associated momenta, the wave momenta of those functions. So sig uh, sigma, the, the symbol, is not eating vectors, it's eating covectors, and it's vanishing on those covectors that are momenta of waves that are noticed by p only to lower order, in other words, representing directions in which p doesn't differentiate as much. Now we need really this theory not for scalar equations, but for non-scalar equations. We want to deal with vectors. We want the unknown function u to be a vector function. And if we do that, and we repeat exactly the same formal expressions we've already been using, we get a theory where the symbol is no longer a function on the cotangent bundle, but it's actually a matrix. Now that really depends on the fact that we're working in coordinates, right? So it would be some kind of linear transformation in more abstract terms, but we won't really, really want to deal with that. For us, we'll just work in coordinates and we'll see it coming out as a symbol matrix. If you just follow exactly the same expressions, so, uh, so we'll have a, uh, the the same theory, but it will so it will depend as a as a homogeneous polynomial on a wave momentum. But the expression that comes out when you plug in that wave momentum, that df, will be not a number like here, but a matrix. And there are examples done in detail in the lecture notes to show how you would calculate this out for various uh, simple uh, systems of equations rather than scalar equations. The characteristic variety is the set of all size, or we could really say psi equals zero hyperplanes in tangent spaces, for which the, the kernel of the symbol matrix is non-zero. Um, going back to the case of scalar uh, PDEs, if you have a scalar equation P, uh, PU equals zero, you could say that we are interested in whether or not the symbol vanishes. Right? But the symbol then in a scalar case, in the case of a scalar equation, the symbol of a scalar equation is a one by one matrix. It's a number. 
So it's a one by one matrix and it's vanishing is exactly it's having non-trivial non kernel. When we work with uh, systems of PDEs, it's not obvious what would be the right analogous condition. We might think we should just still look at where the symbol actually vanishes, but it turns out to be more natural to look at where the kernel is non-zero. In other words, where it's possible to find some vector u that you could plug in so that sig the symbol applied to psi and u would actually be zero, even though u is non-zero, some non-zero solution to the differential equation, which would give you somehow this kind of this kind of uh, characteristic behavior. So, uh, so it's natural to, to look at it as the kernel being non-zero. So that'll be our definition for characteristic variety, set of hyperplanes in each tangent space. Now, tangent space of what, really? Um, so psi here is, a, is thought of as a wave momentum, momentum of, a, of, of an oscillating wave, and the psi equals zero direction is the hyperplane in which the, along which the wave is constant. Um, but a wave where, um, and we want to say that, that, that the um, characteristic variety is roughly something like uh, vanishing, um, give, giving the characteristic variety gives the wave momenta that describe the directions where p has exceptionally few derivatives. It's not literally true, of course, because we're only looking at the kernel of that matrix being non-zero. We're not looking at the matrix being actually zero. So it's a bit tricky, but roughly speaking, it's the directions where p has exceptionally few derivatives. Um, so um, if we don't do this theory for nonlinear PDE, how do we do it? Uh, we've done, done the linear theory now, um, and again, there are lots of uh, examples in the lecture notes, so you really need to work through examples and make sure you can calculate simple cases. The, the linear theory is pretty straightforward. What do we do if we have a nonlinear PDE? How do we deal with it? We'll simply do the obvious thing. We'll linearize it, make a linear approximation, uh, take a solution, say u of x, so pu equals zero, and then we'll expand out by adding a, a function delta u, an arbitrary function to u, and expand out p of u plus delta u is p of u plus some expression in u, linear terms in delta u, dot, dot, dot. So again, this is, there are examples done in the lecture notes so that are quite explicit, where you can see this being calculated out for actual nonlinear PDEs. Um, but it's simple. It's just, just some calculus. You just calculate out some linear approximations of these expressions. Um, so the, um, the, 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 the zero order term actually vanishes because u is a solution. So the zero order term in the expansion vanishes and the, and, and the first order term is what we're interested in. It's the, linearize, uh, the linearization. So this p prime of u is a differential operator, which is the linearization of the nonlinear operator p about the solution u. Now that's how we're going to calculate characteristics. We'll do them from the linearization. You should be worried though. This should worry you because when you think about it, we had to take a solution of the nonlinear equation. And in general, people don't know how to solve um, nonlinear PDEs. There's not much hope of, of, of writing down the solutions. So how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? We can find that uh, that in fact, the linearization, when you freeze its coefficients at a point, um, so you get a constant coefficient equation uh, valued at a point, it actually depends only on the Taylor series of u of x at that point, and only up to the order of the differential operator p. So if you don't know any solutions of the equation p u equals zero, you have no, no solutions of your nonlinear equation, that's okay. You, you start off with a nonlinear equation, you don't have any solutions at all. That's okay. You just write down a formal Taylor series of a solution up to the required order, and then you can formally compute out the linearization, at least as a differential operator, with its coefficients frozen at their values at that particular uh, point x. So we can carry this out uh, without knowing how to solve the nonlinear PDE. And again, there are examples done in the lecture notes of computing these things out. So the characteristic variety for a nonlinear partial differential operator or equation is simply defined by taking a solution. And again, we don't really need an actual solution. We could just work with a Taylor series up to like, the appropriate order. 
Um, and then the characteristic hyperplanes are defined to be the characteristics of the linearization. Okay, so we'll take this solution u of x and we'll construct this perturbation of it, delta u. We'll compu compute out a, a linear differential operator and we'll compute the characteristics of that linearized operator. We should think that the these hyperplanes are in what? We were thinking, thinking of those hyperplanes in the variables x, the space parameterized by the x variables. But actually, for our purposes, we're really interested in, in the long run, in getting back to integral manifolds. So these really should be hyperplanes in the tangent spaces of an integral manifold. In other words, these should be hyperplanes in the integral elements. That's how it's going to work for us. And we'll somehow describe our a manifold on which our exterior differential system lives as having some coordinates, some x's and u's, and then the solutions will be u's of x's and functions, and uh, the characteristics uh, of the linearized operator will be uh, some hyperplanes in the tangent spaces of the integral manifold. They'll represent um, the va vanishing psi equals zero of some wave momentum psi, a momentum that lives on the integral manifold, representing a wave moving across the integral manifold. So we want to get back to the original question, which was how do we figure out if a system of differential equations can be brought into this Cauchy form? Remember the Cauchy form was something like ut equals some function of the other of the various other variables. So we wanted to get to that form, and we wanted to see if we could do it by some change of variables. So we needed a description of differential equations that was much more coordinate independent. It's not very coordinate independent. We still have dependent and independent variables, perhaps living on different manifolds, locally uh, well, described as local coordinates on different manifolds. Nevertheless, we're getting closer to getting rid of the variables because we can talk about these waves just as being functions of the independent variables. We don't need to have the variables actually written out for us, and the theory seems to be almost getting to the point of being coordinate independent. So a differential equation said to be determined that the symbol matrix is square and is also invertible for some value psi, or you could say for some psi equals zero hyperplane. So it's either for a covector psi or a hyperplane psi is zero. Um, that that should be invertible. Now uh, that invertibility is exactly not being characteristic because the symbol matrix is square, so its kernel is uh, is uh, is zero if and only if it's invertible. And so being having this invertibility is exactly having psi being non-characteristic, staying away from the characteristic variety. Okay. So uh, so then uh, one can check rather easily, nice exercise, that if you have an equation in Cauchy form, it actually has a square symbol matrix, and the symbol matrix is invertible when psi is set to be dt. And so this lemma says that that's exactly the same the other way around, that a differential equation has Cauchy form in some coordinates just when it's determined in any coordinates. So a differential equation has Cauchy form in some coordinates just when it's determined. And that's not hard to prove. I'm not going to give any of the details of the proof. Uh, we can just say that clearly psi, uh, if psi is non-characteristic, you can write it as equal to dt for some function t, at least at some point. So it's only defined at one point, it's a covector at a single point. And so there is some function t which has dt equals psi, and then um, that t will be the coordinate function we want to be able to construct coordinates in which the equation has Cauchy form. And again, we're only really interested in the first order case. So for us, we really only want to worry about first derivatives and first order differential equations. They're the, on, they're the only ones we'll need. Higher order equations you can really deal with by treating them as systems of first order equations, as we've seen before. So, um, but the theory is discussed in the notes for arbitrary order. Okay, so what do we like about this lemma? It explains to us how to find whether or not Cauchy form is available in some coordinates without knowing what those coordinates are. For a system given in any coordinates, we could calculate out, all we really need to know is the order of the equation, calculate out the uh, linearization about some uh, solution, about some um, Taylor series of solution up to, some, up to that order, 
and calculate out the characteristics. And we can do this again in some real examples. There are some done in the lecture notes. So this enables us to tell whether or not we have Cauchy form. And once we have Cauchy form, then we have local solvability. And so we can state that as a as a slight variation on the cauchy kowalewski theorem. So the version I gave at the beginning of this lecture is a version that we used in the theory of exterior differential systems so far. It was the, the, the version in Cauchy form. But we can do slightly better, get away from Cauchy form, right, and give this slightly different var variant on the cauchy kowalewski theorem. There are, of course, many variants on the theorem. So we take a determined system of differential equations. So that means square symbol matrix, and the symbol matrix is uh, is invertible for some wave momentum, some covector psi. And uh, we take non-characteristic initial data. So non-characteristic initial data, that's a tricky one. It has to be that the, uh, the, non that the data itself determines the psi that we work on. So they, I'll leave you to check how that works, to, to see that in examples. But we have to pick non-characteristic initial data along an embedded hypersurface. So we pick the initial data so that it creates a non-characteristic um, uh, a non-characteristic integral element or non-characteristic initial data all the way along this embedded hypersurface in the space of independent variables. And I, I will I, I won't worry about uh, carrying this out in, in detail again that you can look at lecture notes for examples to see how to do this. It is tricky to get um, the, to, to understand quite what it means to construct non-characteristic initial data along the hypersurface. But the embedded hypersurface, of course, that's supposed to be t equals zero. The space of independent variables should be the t and x variables, the variables that our, our, our um, function u depends on. And what we're going to do is find that some, we can uh, find some embedded hypersurface which is, uh, on which we have non-characteristic initial data. Then we can use the previous result to change variables to turn it into a, into a Cauchy form problem. And then there is a solution agreeing with initial data along the hypersurface. For a linear system, you don't really need to worry about the initial data being non-characteristic. You just need the non-characteristic of the hypersurface. But for nonlinear systems, you can try some examples, uh, again, in the lecture notes, and see that you have to be careful about the uh, data itself. OK, so there's a solution agreeing along the hypersurface. So that's our, that's our sort of somewhat more invariant formulation of the cauchy kowalewski theorem at this point. It enables us to see whether or not a system could turn out to be um, to be uh, locally solvable without having to understand in quite so much detail what what choice of coordinates we have to take to get it to be in the Cauchy form. Okay. Oh, and any two such agreement of hypersurface, we also want to say that there's a uniqueness. Now that uniqueness is important um, because for for an obvious reason, the existence and uniqueness of these solutions means that if you uh, only had a little piece of that hyperservice, you could construct a local, lo the unique local solution near that one. And another piece of the hyperservice, then you construct the unique solution near that one. The two solutions would have to uh, agree, uh, at least near the hyperservice, where they overlap. So, uh, so we can see that we, we can, can start with that initial data along that hyperservice and, and build uh, a solution near the hyperservice all the way along the hyperservice. So we could actually allow ourselves a little bit more freedom here. When we say the space of independent variables, that could just be some manifold. We could imagine we have a manifold on which the variables, uh, x's, t's, etc., we think of as living, as parameterizing local coordinates there. We could have a manifold, which we think of as the manifold of independent, on which the independent variables live, we have another manifold in which the values of u live. And we could think of u as a map from one manifold to the other. This hyperservice lives in that in that independent variable manifold, um, that source manifold, and you can the value of u lives in some target manifold. But that embedded hyperservice doesn't have to live in a single coordinate chart. Because we have the fact that there's existence and uniqueness of, given the initial data, what we can do is pick that initial data along some embedded hyperservice, which doesn't even lie in a single coordinate chart. Um, and then we know there must exist uh, a solution nearby because this this result gives us the solution in each coordinate chart in little little pieces but the pieces of solution have to fit together to make a global solution so this gives us a, a, a formulation of the kosha kovalevska theorem which if we think about it actually is somewhat more a little bit more global um, it allows us to, to construct solutions using uh, somewhat larger objects than we would have had for the um, 
the, 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 the description of the Cauchy Kovalevsky theorem in terms of Cauchy form. Okay, so summarizing what we've done, we found that we can linearize partial differential equations about their solutions, or even about Taylor expansions up to a certain order of solutions. In our problems, we're only interested in differential equations of order one. And so the Taylor expansions only have to go to order one. They just have to be linear um, objects. In other words, they'll be corresponding exactly to our integral elements. We'll be able to linearize exterior differential systems about integral elements. We can see that coming. We can also say that characteristics are hyperplanes across which exceptionally few derivatives are taken, roughly speaking. So they're special hyperplanes. And if you avoid them, then you can construct non-characteristic initial data for your PDEs. The cauchy kovalevsky theorem, as we've now stated it, is more flexible than the one we started with. It allows us to start to work with embedded hyperplanes, which may be very complicated. And uh, again, it's possible to even get this going in circumstances where we can't work in a single coordinate chart, but still manage to get some global solvability. So next time we'll try and continue this discussion, but going back to exterior differential systems and think about their characteristics and how uh, the characteristic variety shows up in an exterior differential system and how we can use that to understand what sort of initial data we get to pick to solve an exterior differential system.